Hi guys, um, so today we'll do the Bitcoin lecture. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit behind. This was supposed to be Monday's lecture. Uh, I ran into some problems with 366 that needed to be resolved and so um, couldn't quite get to recording for us here. So um, I'll try to catch up, but we're one behind right now. All right, so um, today we'll talk about Bitcoin and specifically Nakamoto's paper. Um, so uh, this is the paper that introduces proof of work or introduced proof of work to the world. Um, um, it introduced Bitcoin together or basically proof of work in the context of Bitcoin is often called the Nakamoto consensus. Um, but he wasn't technically the first person or she wasn't the first person or the group of people weren't the first people. Uh, since we don't know who Nakamoto actually is, to come up with the proof of work idea. Um, so anyway, um, we can talk about the contributions of this paper just to kind of separate what is new about this paper um, from what else has been built upon it since then. All right, so in this paper, um, we basically have a solution to the double spending problem. where a sender of money, let's say a transaction is from A to B, so in double spending, A would be able to send data to B and then send the same, sorry, money to B and then send the same money to C, effectively double spending their account. Um, we want to be able to prevent that to make sure that transfers um, are actually non-reversible, right? So once you send the money to somebody, it stays in that account, there's no way to yank it back. Okay, so basically non-reversible transactions. More broadly, what this paper opens is the possibility of an immutable data storage, right? So no matter how you have your data storage set up before this is there's always a possibility of yanking it back or changing it backwards if you get enough nodes to agree. And what they show here is that you can set up a system where it becomes extremely improbable for uh, data to be, uh, for storage, for the state of the storage to be changed. Um, and the guarantees are so strong that people often think that there actually are foolproof guarantees. No, they're still probabilistic, but um, it is very, very strong. And once we have uh, immutability of storage, we can do all kinds of other things such as save data on there in a way that it can be changed or save the uh, state of some code. This would be a smart contract that was developed later, but it's kind of ba based upon immutability and also save the results of computation onto the blockchain. And, and the smart contracts is what Ethereum introduced into the mix but uh, Ethereum is based on this idea of immutable storage, which is what came out of Bitcoin, okay? So the second contribution, even though it's not explicitly stated, is immutable storage. Okay. Um, so what are the assumptions under which uh, these things hold? Um, so the major thing is that um, you have more than 50%, oops, get over here. More than 50% of computing power is 
at honest nodes. Okay. So it's not that 50% of nodes are honest, though that's sort of what this translates to in a way, but what is really required for the Nakamoto consensus to work is that 50% of computing power um, be honest. Okay, it doesn't actually have to be 50% of the nodes. And so when that is not satisfied, you get things like 51% uh, attack. All right, so the idea is that if an attacker can control more than 50% of the computing power, it's often represented as 51%, then blockchain becomes insecure and none of the guarantees hold. Now, this is a bit different from, um, from the fact that you need two thirds to deal with Byzantine failures, right? So you could still have um, problems with Byzantine nodes uh, kind of slowing this down or preventing preventing consensus but um, if an attacker tries to be honest and kind of make it seem like they're doing the right thing um, basically they 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 need uh, more than one-third of nodes to to screw stuff up right um, they would actually need 51 percent of nodes to screw stuff up and still seem like they're following the protocol so that's the difference between the Byzantine um, the impossibility of Byzantine consensus. Um, okay, so kind of the motivation for, for Bitcoin originally was that uh, we wanted to have this payment system that is fast and cheap and uh, decentralized such that no one can actually control it. And so one question we could ask is, has Bitcoin actually been a success in those terms? And the answer is yes and no, right? Um, Bitcoin became so valuable that the transaction fees along with it have also become extremely um, high, right? And so not only does it take 10 minutes to create a block, um, it might actually be difficult for you to make it into the next block unless you attach with it a high transaction fee, right? So there's only so much space in each block for new transactions. And so if you issue a transaction with a low transaction fee, the miners are not going to be interested in including your transaction in their block because they make less profit uh, than if they included a high paying transaction. Okay? So because the demand for Bitcoin became so high, because the value of Bitcoin became so high, um, there were actually more, way more transactions than space in the blocks. And so by market forces, the cost of transaction also went up. So at the peak of it, it was about $34 uh, per transaction. So let's say you want to buy a pizza for $5 using Bitcoin. Well, now you're going to have to pay a $34 uh, uh, transaction fee on top of that. Okay. So yes, it's a success in terms of it provides a decentralized currency, but um, it is really only useful for very large transfers of money where paying a transaction fee on the order of tens of dollars actually makes sense. Okay, so another major result of, of this um, paper is the proof of work. Okay. And we kind of talked about um, what proof of work is um, specifically in the context of a block. I'm not going to go into that, but if you guys remember, the idea is to um, have a block and then hash it and then make sure that that hash is lower than some value, right? And the lower the threshold, the harder it is to actually come up with a hash that, um, that is low enough. How do you come up with different hashes? Well, in your block, you also include a nonce and you can pick whatever value for nonce you want. You're kind of guessing the nonce value to then your block uh, to hash to a particularly to a low enough or to a low enough value below some threshold, right? And so miners um, just keeps getting those nonces or guessing those nonces until they get a low enough hash for the entire block. All right, so doing that takes some time. It's a probabilistic process. You could technically guess right on the first try, 
But on average, uh, given the difficulty of the problem and the number of miners out there, this is the difficulty is set such that a block is generated about every 10 minutes, um, which also gives enough time for everybody to get the new block after it's being generated and start building the next block on top of it. Okay. So what we so the let me back up actually. So the way this idea started was not in the context of Bitcoin, but in the context of uh, preventing denial of service attacks. So back in the 90s, one of the big problems was that people would connect to, to web servers and make a bunch of requests and basically slow the servers down. So you could do a denial of service attack pretty easily. There wasn't you know, that much distributed infrastructure. Cloud was just kind of coming in barely, right? And so um, people are trying to think of ways to uh, make it harder for a client or an attacker to generate a whole bunch of requests at no cost to them and make the servers do a lot of work to process those requests. And so the idea was to force the clients to do a little bit of work such that they couldn't uh, generate requests for free so that their workload would be commensurate with the server workload. And so um, it would be far more expensive to launch a denial service attack. And the idea there was to, okay, have the request submitted to servers, um, do a proof of work. The server could verify that proof of work and only then serve the request. Thereby, you know, the client will also have to do work or prove that they have done work um, to get the request service. That didn't catch up mostly because there were better solutions to denial of service attacks through firewalls, detection of botnets, and just increasing the capacity of servers. A lot of, a lot of denial of service solutions were actually built inside networks, inside ISPs. Um, so as an idea, this didn't really catch on in terms of preventing denial of service attacks, but um, it, did get, it did get picked up by Nakamoto to, um, in, in this blockchain type of work. So, um, here's, the, here's the basic idea. What we have is a blockchain, and then at some point we have a transaction where there's some transfer of Bitcoin from A to B. Okay, and that is in its own block. Um, and then we have some other set of blocks that ends in another block. Okay, and so once we have six blocks here on top of the block in which transaction happens, it is generally considered, that transaction is generally considered safe. But where does that six come from? Well, it comes from the fact that at the point where uh, there are six blocks on top of the transaction, the receiver, of, the receiver of the transaction, B in this case, can be reasonably certain that um, the attacker won't be able to do a double spending attack. What does a double spending attack look like in this case? Well, after A sends money to B, A can generate an alternative blockchain with some set of blocks, okay? And if that blockchain becomes longer, maybe there's some set of blocks here, okay? Um, if that blockchain becomes longer, then other miners will be able to switch onto this block and then build on top of this as opposed to on top of the block in the transaction. Now, the question is, can the attacker create a longer chain before this transaction here or before this block here gets created and, the, and B accepts the money transfer as, as being done, all right? So, um, to prevent that or to kind of ascertain this probability, we assume, and Nakamoto assumes, that P is greater than Q, okay? And P is the computing power, is the honest computing power and Q is the attacker's computing power. Okay, so if P is greater than Q, then on average, uh, the honest nodes will be able to produce a block faster than the dishonest nodes, okay? So 
the honest chain should be able to grow faster than the dishonest chain. Um, okay, so at the point where uh, the transaction A to B happens, the dishonest chain is already one block behind. And so the question is, can it ever, ever outrun the honest chain? Um, so it's possible that initially, after the A to B transaction, maybe the attacker gets to create this block and maybe gets lucky in creating another block faster, right? But because the process of generating new blocks is, pro is probabilistic, the probability that they'll be able to come up with all seven lucky blocks is unlikely or it's less likely than, uh, or becomes basically diminishingly small, right? So um, the longer the sequence grows of, of blocks in the honest chain versus the dishonest chain, um, and the honest blocks are generated more quickly, it makes it less and less likely that the dishonest chain will be able to grow faster because the only way it can do it is by getting lucky on blocks. And uh, it is very, very unlikely or becomes less and less likely that they will get lucky on all the blocks or enough of the blocks to outrun an honest chain as the number of acceptance blocks here in this, in this case six gets longer. Okay. Um, so what Nakamoto showed is that given a certain assumptions on the value on P and Q, six blocks would be basically long enough uh, to be reasonably certain that uh, less than 50% of computing power is not going to be possible to outrun um, the honest chain. Okay? So that's kind of the major result here. So one of the ways that Nakamoto stated um, the kind of governance model in, in this, because the governance model being everybody gets to vote on what the honest blockchain is, is one CPU, one vote. Now, in practice, that doesn't really check out because CPUs are not equal to each other. Um, for example, it's possible to use GPUs to mine, to mine Bitcoin. Uh, something that's actually not possible in, um, in Ethereum, um, or it doesn't give you as much of an advantage in Ethereum. Um, and so if you can spend more money, you can buy yourself more, uh, more uh, CPUs and more powerful CPUs, right? Um, now, miners can also band in mining pools, which can disseminate blocks and transactions to each other faster, thereby being able to mine on the new block, starting the mining process on a new block earlier. Okay. This creates this rich get richer problem um, where if you are able to make money on mining, you can then take that money to buy yourself additional CPUs, which then makes it more likely that you're gonna generate the next block, which means you make more money, which means you buy yourself more CPUs. Okay. So rich get richer. Um, now, this problem becomes even worse when you realize that as you make more and more money, you can not only buy yourself more CPUs, but you can also buy CPUs at a discounted rate because you make bigger orders, right? And so um, you'll start getting richer even faster. So this rich get richer problem is um, significantly problematic in Bitcoin and it's addressed to some extent in the proof of stake uh, we'll talk about when we get into um, Ethereum. Okay. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, okay, I think that's good on a proof of work. So a couple other details about, about this is um, transactions. So the way that money is uh, spent is actually um, by having input and output transactions. So let's say that we have the first block and whoever generated that block, let's say A, A ends up getting um, 10 Bitcoin. Okay, so that's our first block. Now in the next block, what needs to happen is that A 
wants to spend, send some money to B and the value of that is three. Okay, so three coins go to B. Now, that creates an imbalance in the transfer, right? Because B has three, but it's not clear what, what A has. <coughs> so what actually needs to happen as well is that A sends money into A, and that's the remainder of what has been sent to B from that particular account, okay? So there's actually two transfers. One is to the actual recipient, and the other one is to um, is back to A itself. Okay, so that's kind of a simplification. What would actually happen more? Well, what would actually happen more realistically is that um, A sends money to B, and that's the three. Okay, but A sends the money to some other value, some other uh, wallet, which would be, let's say, um, I don't know, we can call it X, we can call it A prime, okay? And this would be the seven, okay? So A and A prime don't have anything to do with each other other than they're both controlled by, uh, controlled by, I don't know, some entity, some entity that owns both the A account and the A prime account, right? Um, and so these are obviously, as we discussed before, these would be public keys. And so uh, to transfer money, the money would go from A's public to an account identified by A's public key to an account identified by B's public key and to an account identified by A prime's, uh, by A prime public key. All right. Um, okay. Let's see what else, what else we got here. Um, okay, so I mentioned already that miners will hold um, the current log of the blockchain. So miners will hold all the different blocks that, that have been created. Um, and they will also hold all the different transactions that, that are inside those blocks, okay? Miners will then disseminate uh, blocks that have been completed and pending transactions that have been submitted to the blockchain among each other such that if I'm a miner, I might get new transactions to submit from users that send those transactions to me or from other miners that uh, disseminate new transactions or uncommitted transactions among themselves, okay? Now, in the context of your project, we already assume that miners have some set of transactions that they want to submit. So you guys don't need to implement this uh, transaction dissemination process. You can assume that miners just have transactions and that's what they submit and that's great. All right, so one question that then comes up is how do we actually reduce the storage requirements of a blockchain? So let's say that we have some set of transactions, call them T1, T2, T3, and T4. Now we could put all those transactions into a blockchain, but that's actually a lot of work, so, or a lot of space. So instead what we're going to do is we'll compute a Merkle tree of those transactions. We'll compute hash one, hash two, hash three, and hash four using some cryptographic hash such as SHA-256 or SHA-3 or whatever, okay? And then we can compute the hashes of those hashes. So this would be hash one, two. This would be hash three, four, okay? <clears throat> and then finally we can compute hash um, one, four, which is the hash of the two previous hashes. So what's actually gets saved into the block is just this hash, okay? So while the block itself contains the different, just the different root hashes, the miners will still keep track of um, the different transactions that went into this that, that comprise each block, okay? So that's one way to kind of um, disseminate a block more quickly 
which allows miners to then start mining the new block and they can get the transactions that comprise a block um, a little bit a little bit later um, okay so um, let's say that um, okay so let's say then that we want to to tran to truncate this log okay hey Well, that's kind of a good question, right? Because when we talked about the log and dictionary problem, after the dictionary is updated, we can um, just get rid of the old, the old uh, log that, that comprises or kind of that contributed to the current state of the dictionary. Well, that's not true in Bitcoin, right? To know how much money a particular account actually has we need to walk back through all the transactions prior to that and see the flow of cryptocurrency into that account. Okay, so in our example above, if we want to know how much money is, how much money B has, well, then we, we need to find the transaction that transfers money into B. Okay, and so we know the money into B came from A, so then we need to verify how much money was actually in A, and then we can kind of go back uh, presumably all the way back to the origin block um, to find the source of the money. And then we also need to make sure that there wasn't some transaction where B actually spent the money, right? So if we have a transaction here where B sends the money to C to, okay, then we know that now B only has one Bitcoin left and so maybe that's enough or not enough for a particular transaction, okay? So if there's a new block being proposed where let's say B sends to, uh, to D, okay? Now that block, let's say someone mined it, okay? That's actually not following the protocol because they should check first before including the transaction in the block if there's enough money. But if they were to disseminate this block to other nodes, then those other nodes could or should go through the, through the transactions and make sure that those transactions are legal before they start building a block on top of that block, right? If they don't do it, someone could reject that block later on and say, hey, whatever else was build, built on top of the block isn't, isn't valid. We're going back to this block here um, to, 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 to mine from that because this is the, the last correct block, okay? Now, one way we could get around this is if we so this is a possible idea that's actually not implemented is if we recorded uh, the state of the dictionary with consensus. Okay, so let's say that at some point we kind of computed the state of all the different accounts Right, and said, okay, this is how much money everyone has at the end of, I don't know, this block that we just checked here, okay? And send it to all the other miners and all the other miners could agree on this. We could then record, run some consensus mechanism, have people sign that, yep, they vote on this block being correct. We could write it onto the blockchain and at that point, all the previous blocks before it could go away because we have consensus on the state of the, of the dictionary. Okay? And so this is not implemented, you know, that block would potentially take a lot of space. So it would create a pause in transactions. Uh, maybe people could force these blocks to, um, to kind of slow the process down. So not a part of Bitcoin, but I think it would be quite interesting to, to try to implement something, maybe in a smaller private blockchain. Um, maybe the consensus could be over some smaller set of uh, transactions be between a smaller set of nodes, right? So if like, let's say five nodes use the blockchain for uh, some computation between them, they could all agree on what the state of the dictionary is and then direct the blockchain to, to delete the, uh, some previous set of transactions, right? Um, so in that case, we could delete, I don't know, T3 and T4 and just keep the hashes of them 
in the chain. Okay, so that's kind of an idea for a project if anyone's kind of interested in pursuing this further. Um, all right, I think that's about um, wraps it up for Bitcoin. It's a pretty uh, simple paper at this point because we already know so much about how blockchains work, but um, it's still kind of good to understand where the ideas came from and, and what actually was part of Bitcoin and what wasn't. All right, thank you guys.